In this video, we're going to continue talking about muscles of the anterior abdominal wall by discussing the oblique muscles, and there are two of them. The first one we're going to talk about here is the external abdominal oblique muscle, but there's also an internal abdominal oblique muscle, which is deep to this one. And technically, these muscles are part of the anterior abdominal wall, but location-wise, as you can see here in the green, uh, the muscular part of these is actually more anterolateral. So that's why over here, location, I've written anterolateral abdominal wall, because these are going to exist laterally to the rectus abdominis. If you look over here in the picture, which we mentioned previously was from Rocky IV. This is, of course, Rocky, played by Sylvester Stallone. But in the center here, you can see the muscle bellies of rectus abdominis. And remember that down the middle line, uh, between the two halves of the rectus abdominis, we have the linea alba. And then right here, approximately, you have the linea semilunaris, or the semilunar line. And anatomically, that divides the rectus abdominis from the ipsilateral oblique muscles. And actually, at the star right here, uh, this is actually going to be the external oblique muscle on the left. Now, in the picture here in green, we have the muscular part of the muscle. And then this white tissue right here is the aponeurosis of the external oblique. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Now, the origin of the external oblique muscle is going to be the external surfaces of ribs 5 through 12. So if we look at this picture right here, up at the top, here's rib number 1, and then rib 2, rib 3, 4, and then here's 5. And you can see the origin of the external oblique off of that. And it would actually have an origin on all the ribs, all the way down to number 12. Now, the insertions of the external oblique muscle in general have to do with this white tissue, this aponeurosis. And remember that an aponeurosis is basically a tendon, but it's a very broad tendon. Usually when you use the term tendon, it's referring to something thin like a rope. And then these broad tendons that have either a broad origin or in this case a broad insertion, these are aponeuroses. And so the external oblique muscle is going to insert on the linea alba, as you see right here. Remember, the linea alba, as we mentioned, uh, divides the halves of the rectus abdominis. It goes all the way from the xiphoid process down here to the pubic symphysis. That being said, part of the insertion of the external oblique is also going to be on the pubic tubercle, which is going to flank the pubic symphysis on either side, and then also on the anterior half of the iliac crest right here. Okay, so all of this is going to be the insertion of the external oblique muscle. Now for the actions of the external oblique muscle. And the specific actions are going to depend on whether the right and left halves of the muscle are contracting together or just one at a time. And so for a bilateral contraction, both left and right halves together, the actions are going to be very similar to what we see for the rectus abdominis. You're going to get trunk flexion, like when you're doing a sit-up, but also compression of the abdominal viscera during forced expiration and intense effort, like when you're lifting a very heavy object like in deadlift and performing a valsalva maneuver. Okay? And in fact, all of the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall are going to have this function. Now for unilateral contraction. And let's suppose for this example, it's the right external oblique muscle that's contracting. Well, you're going to get ipsilateral trunk lateral flexion. In other words, ipsilateral trunk side bending, and then contralateral, sorry for the misspelling, trunk rotation. So for the right external oblique muscle, that would produce right side bending of the spine, or the trunk, and then left rotation of the trunk. Now, like the rectus abdominis muscle, the innervation of the external oblique muscle is segmental. So it gets contributions from the intercostal nerves, from roots T7 to T11, and also from the subcostal nerve, nerve root T12. These are the motor contributions to the external oblique muscle. So just getting the muscle to contract is from these nerves. But this muscle also has some sensory innervation, okay? and that's via the iliohypogastric nerve, which is one of the nerves that comes off of the lumbar plexus. It's sensory only and has a nerve root contribution from L1. And then the blood supply to the external oblique is via the lower posterior intercostal arteries, the subcostal artery, and the deep circumflex iliac artery. Now, before we transition to talking about the internal oblique muscle, I wanted to take a moment to look at the fiber orientation of the external oblique and compare that to the internal oblique. So right now we have both halves right and left of the external oblique. 
There's a couple ways to look at this. So if we start laterally and move medially toward the midline, so moving medially, the fibers seem to have a downward orientation, okay, more inferior. We could also look at it medially laterally, so as we move out, the fibers seem to have an upward or a superior orientation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this left external oblique along with the aponeurosis and I'm going to remove it. And we're going to expose the underlying or the deep internal oblique muscle. So first of all, look at the fiber orientation. As we go lateral to medial, notice that the fiber orientation is upward. If we went lateral to medial for the external oblique, the fiber orientation is downward. So we already have a difference there. We could also look uh, medial to lateral for the internal oblique, and in general, going medial to lateral, the fibers now have a downward orientation. This orientation of the fibers is what's going to create a difference in how each of these oblique muscles perform rotation of the trunk. Remember that for the external obliques, the rotation is contralateral. We'll see in just a minute that for the internal obliques, the rotation is ipsilateral. The other thing to notice is where the muscle belly is. So notice for the external oblique, the muscle belly is a little bit higher up. But for the internal oblique, the muscle belly is a little bit lower, more inferior. So that leads us to talking about the internal oblique muscle. So again, the muscular part of this is more lateral. So like the external oblique, I'm calling the location more the anterolateral abdominal wall. But in general, we're still calling this all anterior abdominal wall. Now the origin of this muscle is pretty broad. So this muscle is going to originate off of the anterior two-thirds of the iliac crest, so right in this area here. It's also going to originate from the iliopectineal arch, which is down here, and then also posteriorly on the thoracolumbar fascia, which we cannot see here. We'll talk about this more in the next video when we discuss the transversus abdominis. But the thoracolumbar fascia also serves as an attachment point for the transversus abdominis. It also does here for the internal oblique muscle. And this actually allows both the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis to play a role in stabilizing the lumbar spine. If that doesn't make sense now, go watch the next video and it will make a little bit more sense. But note that this thoracolumbar fascia is an attachment point shared by both of those muscles. Now the insertions of the internal oblique muscle are also fairly broad. So there's attachments on the inferior borders of ribs 10 through 12. So starting up here, we've got rib 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and you can see rib number 10 right here. Can't see 11 and 12, but again, it inserts on those as well. Also inserting on the linea alba, which runs down the midline here, on the pubic crest, and also on the pectineal line via the conjoint tendon. So those are the insertions of the internal oblique. Now for the actions. Again, the actions depend on whether or not the right and left halves of the muscle are contracting bilaterally or unilaterally. So if it's bilateral contraction, again, very similar to what we saw for both the rectus abdominis and the external obliques, we get trunk flexion and also compression of the abdominal viscera during forced expiration and intense effort. We've seen this before. Now with unilateral contraction, let's say for this one we'll consider the left internal oblique muscle. So both the lateral flexion and rotation that are produced are ipsilateral. So the left internal oblique will produce left side bending, also called left lateral flexion of the trunk, and also left rotation. So note that the direction of lateral flexion, aka side bending, is the same for internal and external obliques, but the direction of rotation differs. And that difference has to do with the fiber orientation that we talked about before. So if you were given a question, what oblique muscles are going to contribute to, let's say, left side bending? Well, it's always ipsilateral for side bending. So it'll be the left external and left internal obliques. But what about for right rotation? Well, for right rotation, it's going to be the right internal obliques, but the left external obliques because their rotation is contralateral. Now for the innervation of the internal oblique muscle. It too is segmental, just like what we saw for the rectus abdominis and the external oblique muscles. So again, intercostal nerve and subcostal nerves, those are going to be the motor contributions to the internal oblique muscles, nerve root contributions from T7 to T11, 
and T12 respectively. But then, like with the external oblique muscle, there's a little bit of sensory innervation to the muscle belly. But this time it's provided by two nerves from the lumbar plexus, iliohypogastric nerve and ilioinguinal nerve, and they both have nerve root contributions of L1 from the lumbar plexus. And then the blood supply to the internal oblique muscle, pretty extensive here. You see the lower posterior intercostal artery, the subcostal artery, the superior and inferior epigastric arteries, superficial and deep circumflex arteries, and the posterior lumbar arteries. So that concludes our discussion of the external and internal oblique muscles. In the next video, we're going to take a look even deeper, peel off that internal oblique muscle, and see the underlying transversus abdominis, which is often a topic of consideration in the physical therapy clinic, particularly for people with low back pain and those coming out of lumbar surgeries. So make sure to join us then when we discuss the TRA muscle. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.